Hi, this is Terry Edom, author of The End of Fossil Fuel Insanity, and I write for the BOE Report and my website, Public Energy Number One. Thank you for joining the programs here today. Appreciate it. And we're going to be talking about a couple interesting topics in our international energy segment because you're up in Canada. Where are you at in Canada? Just barely over the border. I'm in Calgary. But, yeah, I guess it's another country. And so do you, for now. But, but would you say you primarily write about uh, Canadian energy issues? I know a lot of the energy stuff you write about transcends uh, geography, but I suppose, you know, you, you got to have that Canadian influence, huh? Well, yeah, I probably do, uh, my accent, if nothing else, but <laughs> the, um, the, the market is, it's truly an, uh, an international market here. Like we, I work for a natural gas producer. We sell all our gas into Chicago. And so I, I pay as much attention to the Marcellus or more than, than anything else, and uh, we watch the Permian like a hawk, and, and that too. So most of our product, because we're landlocked, with because of the crazy environmental situation here, we can't get our product to coastlines. We can't get any pipelines built, so we sell all our market to the all our products to the U.S. So it's like we're one big happy family, except we have crazier politicians than you do, believe it or not. You you pay attention to the uh, uh, Marcellus, huh? Yes. So New, the, uh, when, when, New York doesn't allow pipelines, just like Canada. Uh, I know it, it is. I don't. I don't know how anyone can even wrap their head around what New York is doing. If, if, if people have been reading in the news, um, they won't allow any new pipelines to be constructed. At the same time, there's a whole bunch of new customers in New York City. There's, I've heard twenty thousand. Um, but recently, um, Como. Um, Governor Cuomo ordered National Grid, the utility, to hook up 1,100 new customers, even though the utility said, we don't have enough gas to supply these people in times of crisis. And he ordered them to do it anyways. And if you if you try and over-deliver um, in times of extreme need, like a cold snap, you, you can depressurize the system and put everyone at risk. And the solution, and this just blows my mind, um, the solution is they're building uh, CNG, compressed nat- natural gas truck terminals, to haul gas from the Marcellus to Long Island when it's needed during the winter. So they're actually going to start trucking natural gas because they think that's better than having a natural gas pipeline. And I don't, I, I'm speechless when I hear these solutions, but that's what they've come up with. One of the reasons we're having you on the program today is uh, public energy number one, your blog, your writerness if you will uh more of an opinion type of a platform that's how i kind yep. of uh, look at it well when you're an, when you're an author you're you're writing books there's a that, that there's a specific yeah. platform involved there in the boe report it's more of a journalism type magazine traditional format right uh you know whereas the public energy number one you get a you know do a little more of the op ed type stuff uh from yeah. from, from a start, newspaper start type of book hmm yeah, I mean, what traditionally people would kind of look at, you know, on the op-ed page from a newspaper. Uh, that's how I kind of look at no. it. Because here you're yeah, posing the, a the, question. The news, Go ahead. Oh, I'd say that the news stream is so dominated by, um, I would just say, sheer ignorance. Like there's, um, the, the, you pick up any credible news source and they talk about how they, they just um, re- regurgitate the statistics about how renewable energy is taking over and electric vehicles are taking over. It's just not true. It's just, it's just um, this wave of almost I call it propaganda. And so uh, I, I just try and stand up and say, hey, actually, there's more going on below the surface than what you see. But it's hard to get people's attention because they don't really care about energy. They just take it for granted. So this piece that you wrote uh, October nineteenth, uh, who made your job, a government or an entrepreneur? That's that, that was a really great headline oh glad um, you liked it. oh thanks yeah yeah and, and that's actually a question i've actually posed to people before to where i've i've said mm-hmm. you know you know um when we honor a lot of these people at sporting events and and a lot of these other things i always noticed that we we you know it started out with uh say like police and firefighters that would go above and beyond 
their call of duty type. That's where that first, you know, he'd stand up and give them this and that. Well, now they're, you know, politicians are starting to, to thank them for showing up to basketball games. And I'm going, okay, all right, enough's enough here to where when we, what we need to do is we need to say anybody who's a, who's a small business owner, an entrepreneur, stand up and give them a rousing um, uh, round of applause for creating a marketplace so everybody could pay taxes so they could pay all those other people we just gave homage to. Does that make sense? Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's, oh, yeah. You go couldn't ahead. have said that any better. Well, that, that's, that's that, that, that was going through my <laughs> mind at all these sporting events. So when I read your headline, I'm going, oh, I got to have him on the show and we got to talk about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, it's not my idea, of course. I've stolen it. But like Nassim Taleb, the guy that wrote The Black Swan and a bunch of other fantastic books, he, he, he singles out entrepreneurs for praise. And he says, like, that's what makes our way of life uh, work essentially and gives us everything we have is that the people are willing to step up and say I'm going to give that a whirl I'm going to try and start my own business and and um, if it works they get rich and that's fantastic and if it don't if it doesn't a lot of these guys they just try again so it's a certain type of person that that is willing to step up and take that risk a lot of people just want a steady paycheck or they're content working for whatever um, but those aren't the ones that really innovate things. So uh, I, I think we owe a debt of gratitude to those people. So speaking from an international energy standpoint, I know you guys are looking at the global marketplace all the time, and you're based out of yeah. Canada. You've got a completely different government than you know the United States does and, and China does and South America. Does. Well, maybe not so much South America, but definitely the other ones. <laughs> Um, and I didn't, yeah, I didn't mean that to be funny, but I kind of walked myself into it but there. It <laughs> yeah. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. I mean, you know, you mentioned something about, you know, starting up small businesses and my mind goes right away to well, how do you even start up a small business in Canada? Can you, because you guys are more, you guys are more socialist than you are capitalists. Yep. And it's getting more regulated all the time. So it's, it's getting much harder to start anything, just the, the regulatory burdens, are multiplying and some of it like environmental standards that's fine that's that's a good thing but just the the red tape and the um and the i wouldn't say anti-business sentiment but sort of the anti-business sentiment people just don't value it the way that they the way that they should so it's um uh, uh, i was just talking to someone down the hall here about um an article that i i haven't read it this is just second-hand information about people moving to the u.s and just finding it night and day different to get business done down there compared to here. Um, and it might be we're just further along that curve than you are. Like if like if you get uh, Democrats elected down there, like it could get a lot harder to um, – and, and I'm looking from the energy perspective here where uh, – it, but it's, it's sort of prevalent across the country, I would say, in, in other industries as well. But in energy in particular – there's so many people here that have turned against it and almost turned against resources in general. You know, Canada is a resource-based economy, and we export a lot of everything, but the uh, people just take that for granted, too. They, they don't realize what creates all the jobs and the, the income. So, so but it might be tough your way, too. What's what's the latest with Trudeau then? Somebody wanted me to ask you about that because the, he has some extreme well, policies, or is is he a relative uh, uh, threat to the industry? Like say Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, and well, there's a lot more growing. Uh, what's her name? Um, AOC. I forget her name. Oh um, yeah, AOC. I can't remember it either. I tried. Cortez. To Cortez. Uh, yeah. And, Anyway, you, you know my point is that there are a number of presidential candidates trying to ban the oil and gas industry. I'm not familiar with Canadian politics, but somebody said Trudeau, is he trying to ban pipelines or something along those lines? What, what are, oh, are, Do you guys yeah. have politicians that are flat out trying to ban your industry? Oh, yeah, we do. Um, and actually, funny you mentioned that we're having our election today, so we might get rid of Trudeau or he might be around for a few more years. Um but we kind of we have two main parties, which would be like your Democrats and Republicans. We have the conservatives, Republican style, I guess, and then the liberals, which are a little bit more like the Democrats. But we've also got two far left parties that are that are in the in the wings too. The uh, NDP, they call them National Democratic Party or New Democratic Party or something, and the Greens, and they're rising up everywhere 
too. So, um, so those three are kind of jockeying for that uh, climate change perspective. The Liberals have tried to, and even Trudeau, he's tried to walk a bit of a tightrope. Like he has supported one pipeline. He's vetoed a bunch of others. Um, so he's been generally unfriendly to the to the energy sector, but but there's that uh, I call it the when you get handed the keys syndrome. A lot, a lot people like AOC or Warren or whoever they, they can talk talk as tough as they want when they're sitting on the sidelines. You can promise anything, but when you're actually put in the big chair and you say, okay, you make the decisions now. If Warren ever gets put into power, I've heard her down there saying, um, I'm going to ban fracking on day one. Well, I'd like to see her try that. I'd like to see what would happen in the U.S. if that happened. And so I think that's sort of what happened in Canada here. And we've seen it at various levels. We had that with the provincial government here. Uh, a woman became premier four or five years ago. She was really anti-pipeline before she got elected. Then after she got elected and she's responsible for the economy, all of a sudden she started to like pipelines. And so there's a, a level of reality that kicks in for people, to, and it went for Warren too. And so Trudeau crossed that bridge a little bit, but he, he's surrounded, like his inner circle is people from their environmental extremists from the uh, World Wildlife Fund and that sort of thing. So they're just hardcore anti-climate change people. But at the same time, he works with his finance people and says, well, we've got to keep this country afloat, so we need that money. And uh, so it, it's kind of a pathetic thing to watch but um you'll you'll see it on the democratic side too if you if if warren gets in or or heaven forbid sanders or somebody like that um they'll they'll step back on some of those policies because they have to i mean if just think what would happen in the u.s if you did if she was to ban fracking like think of the repercussions for not just uh texas and the the other regions but think of the cost of fuel how it would spike Think of the dependence. Think of how much money's gone into um, natural gas export facilities and oil export facilities, and that would dry up if fracking stopped. So the, it would just like a, a major earthquake. Uh, so she, she can say whatever she wants, but when she gets, if she gets in, um, I think it would be just far harder to uh, to get anything done. And that, that's what happened with Trudeau here, who's sort of our centrist. He's still unpopular because he's killed so many projects and he's made it so hard to get anything done, um, but it could be slightly worse, I have to admit. I want to ask you a question just because of your background. You know, we, at the gr- crude life here, we tend to only interview experts for what their, you know, what, what their field is. And how long have you worked in the media? Media, about uh, 10 years, I guess. And you're, yeah. you've, you've written a book, and you've, yep. uh, you've, you write for the BOE report and you have a blog. And so, yep. okay, 10 years of, of working day to day in a media environment. And then how long have you been in the oil and gas industry? Uh, 28 years. Okay. So that's incredible. All right. So based on your experience in the media, coupled in with your experience on how much of our lives, our daily lives, um, have to do with petroleum products and fossil fuels, et cetera. Where, where, what do you make of the media's responsibility in this? Because I've mentioned to you before that I think, you know, when somebody says we're going to ban fossil fuels in 10 years, as a media professional, that is a legitimate somewhat of a crazy statement. Like I, I would put them in the fringe category, category that yes. sort of thing. Uh, you, what, do, what do you make of that? I mean, you're up in Canada. What, what do you think of that? Well, it, it does border on irresponsible to me, but it's it's all part of the, the mystery that I can't really unravel as to how these people get in this place. I went for coffee with a Reuters journalist not that long ago, and, and she, she's quite... She has a bit more of a, a balanced viewpoint. She understands it um, quite green green to the core, I suppose, but she understands the need for fossil fuels. But I was trying to discuss with her, like, how come that never gets out into the media stream? And she didn't have a good answer either. It just seems that it's these dominant narratives that get uh, pushed um, by, by I, don't, I don't know if it's just special interest groups or, or, or if the media thinks that that's what interests people. But if you take something like um, the anti-fossil fuel movement, one of the biggest anti-fossil fuel people out there is Michael Bloomberg, 
who controls Bloomberg News, which is a pretty major news feed, even up here in Canada and around the world. And he's put $500 million of his own money into a fund to, um, to get off fossil fuels, including killing off natural gas. And th- that's, not my, that's not a conspiracy theory. You can find that anywhere. He, he took over, uh, he has a Bloomberg New Energy Finance or whatever his site is called. And, um, and it, it, so, that, so it's, like a, it's almost like a propaganda arm against fossil fuels and the strange part is like you say that it's we're just so reliant on it and i think the average person sees this if you actually challenge them to like they might hear all about climate change and they're scared about about it because all of the scientists in quotation marks say that it's all we're all doomed in 20 or 30 years or 10 years or whatever and the 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 average joe or jane on the street kind of hears this and they get nervous about it but then they hop in their car and they drive home anyways because they say well i gotta get the kids and i gotta get dinner um i don't have time to worry about that stuff and and that's the 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 um just the the flow of life that goes on and so we have these groups and the media trying to convince people and I, and I think part of the issue is that they've they've tried to do what they think is the best thing for the planet like these people that really believe we are doomed in 10 or 12 years, there are people that truly believe this. And so they're, they're thinking that they're acting to save humanity. So I think it's for journalists maybe, and they tend to just be biased on the side of, well, I'd rather, I'd rather be fighting the good fight. If I'm going to err on one side, do I want to err on the side of big oil, which has a bad reputation? And that's what fossil fuels are equated with big oil big, dirty, money, old, rich, middle-aged white guys that are dominating the third world to pillage it. And, and that's the association that the environmental groups have made. So, so when it comes time for the media to cover something, they seem to just default to the climate change perspective, which means almost by default that you're throwing fossil fuels under the bus. And, and I, I think that causes great uh, confusion amongst the general public because they can see that, that they don't live without fossil fuel i mean everybody can see that but um there's there's an industry that's developed to convince people that they can so it, it, it's a it's a ugly world out there are you following this greta thurnberg story i think that's her name oh lord she's been wandering around western canada here i mean she's just a, just a, she's a good example of a, a scared kid she's been convinced of what's coming down the pipe for her, that she that her future is that she's doomed and, and and the irony of this is it's unbelievable so she she toured through the united states she showed up in canada here last week and she quietly came into calgary the heart of oil patch country here she didn't do any media interviews or anything she was seen wandering around downtown going to the tour sites down by the river she was photographed then she went uh, and toured the rest of the province and i hear she's at a resort Jasper, which is a spectacular uh, skiing resort uh, in the Rocky Mountains, and then she's going to head on her merry way. And it's like, what? What is going on here? Here's this kid on a, and she's a tourist now, and she's doing the very thing that she's criticizing the entire world for. And it's like I said, she's just a kid, and and but they're, the people that are filling her head with these things have 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 her convinced that this duality um, is somehow rational. This, that you can go ahead and be a tourist. It's okay if you want to be a tourist, but everybody else has to quit using fossil fuels. What, what, and the insanity is just off the charts. The, what you said, though, is a real story behind this, in my opinion, is the people behind it is the real story. Yes. Is yeah. Why is there nobody calling out the people behind it saying, OMG, you're using a teenage girl as your mouthpiece to use for propaganda reasons? That to me is mind-blowing that that is, there's not a media outlet out there even calling that out. They're allowing a 16-year-old girl to use emotion over science. This is blowing my mind. Yeah, they're not just allowing it, they're encouraging it. They're encouraging it, that's what I mean. This is really bizarre yeah. to me, Terry. This is really bizarre to me. It really is. And they put this kid in front of the microphones. And who's going to who, who's going to critique a sixteen year old um, girl? I mean, with with, with autism, or she's she's got Asperger's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she she does get attacked, but the, but that's just 
th- that's what they want. They want people to attack her, and they go, whoa, look at the wing nuts. They're attacking a 16-year-old Swedish girl. How crazy are they? And, 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 but then they feed her these lines, and she says whatever. And she, I'm sure she believes a lot of it because she is a terrified kid. Like, a lot of kids are terrified. If, if you hear this relentless barrage from the media and from teachers even at school and from these um, uh, left-wing politicians saying, we have to do this or we're going to be all dead in 12 years. Well, that gets to a kid. They, they notice that. They're not dumb. They're, they're, uh, so they absorb all of this relentless media messaging and then, they, and then they sort of want to act on it, but they don't really want to act on it. Now you're whose kids were, uh, were all upset about climate change and what are we going to do and we're all going to die. And he said, oh, well, okay, well, we have to take this into our own hands then. Let's, let's plan as a family. What are we going to do? And so this means we're not going on a holiday next year, right? Like there's no Disneyland. And they're like, well, what do you mean <laughs> no holidays? But people have to start making that connection for these kids. Like if you, but no, no one will do it. Like you say, no one will stand up to these kids and no one will, like, like like how how this girl is is wandering around she's out of school wandering around north america by diesel powered train telling everyone that we're doomed if we don't stop living exactly like she's living and she she's she's one of the one percent or maybe two percent in the world in terms of her lifestyle and what she has and and the, the life she's allowed to live never mind all the money she's making off of this or her family is but just her situation in general, she's one of the incredibly privileged kids compared to billions in India or China who would kill for her lifestyle, never mind saying that it's doomed. Um, and, and she's now a tourist like everybody else, and at the same time preaching against tourism. It, it's just, it defies reality so much that it's really hard to put into words. I, I view it as just predatory behavior, that there yeah. are people that are being predatory on a minor. I mean, for crying out loud, your hypothalamus isn't even fully developed till you're in your 20s. Yeah. I mean, there, there, there are laws that are created because of the development of a child's mind. And here you're telling somebody that the world's going to end in 10 years and that's being funded by the UN. That is really right. bizarre to me. It's utterly shameless. It's, it's, uh, it's, yeah. Unbelievable, but I mean, if you imagine imagine an oil company, Exxon Mobil, doing that, putting out a, a, a teenage girl as their spokesman. That, that, that's what I'm saying. It's it's you. If if any of the roles were reversed, and you were doing a few other things like that, it would be it, it would be un, it would be historic. But it would be. We'd be looking at jail time. Yeah. The, the, yeah. The, anyway, I so I wanted to ask you about that too because I see that she was just in Canada and um, how how was it received? I mean, I saw there was some energy protesters, uh, oil and gas people, um, kind of, and there's some vandalism at one of her murals. I don't know if you followed that or not, but um, I wanted to ask you about what the public perception is up there of this whole thing. Well, it's there's there's the, the sympathetic side, the, the people that are convinced that we are doomed uh, climate-wise if we don't change our ways in an incredible, uh, uh, incredibly short time period. They, they, they suck it up and they say, see, there's this, the kids get it and they, it's a youth movement of today. And so, so there's that group. And so she does have her supporters, but it, it, I think it's pretty much divided on political lines. Um, the hardcore left are all for that. Um, and they support it wholly because it's, they could, it's a way to, to damage business. And so they're they're lined up behind that, um, and then and then there's the, the a lot of the population just is indifferent, and then there's the part of the like the pro fossil fuels. I wouldn't say pro fossil fuels, but the pro, pro reality who realize the importance of fossil fuels. They're kind of scared to say of things, um, but they but the, the the Greta's of the world like and the Extinction Rebellion. I don't know if they've hit the U.S. yet in a big way the European movement where they're, they're basically anarchists. They're just saying the governments aren't doing anything. So we're going to shut down everything. And, um, they're blockading bridges and streets in London. They, they hit, they hit Edmonton a couple of weeks ago too. They shut down a big bridge at rush hour and, uh, people were pretty irate. And so I think the public opinion is starting to turn against them. Um, just because they're, they're, they're so, and, and, and just hypocritical. It's just, if people start paying attention, they realize 
that the hypocrisy is just off the charts, like even with Greta uh, on her grand tour of, of North America here, preaching one thing and doing another, and, and she's like the the uh, savior to the movement. So uh, I, I don't know, just to, that, that's, well, that's why I write as much as I do and where I wrote the book, and just to try and get people to think beyond the media narrative. And I, and I don't, I'm not necessarily, I don't go out of my way to praise oil and gas companies or the industry. I mean, there's been a lot done wrong and a lot could be done better. But it's just, I just want people to think about what they're hearing and uh, think critically about it and look around at the way the world really works. I wanted to ask you about, I don't know how much time you got, but um, just about uh, a lot. the, <laughs> you, you brought up something earlier that I've never thought about this and I've never talked about this, but this is a really interesting part about the whole banning fossil fuels, um, you know, just spitballing is really all it should be. It yeah. should have never made it out of a spitball session. You know what I mean? Um, because, <laughs> well, the, the facilities, when, when I think of the, you know, the refineries and the, and the little ref, the little micro refineries and, and all the different things that they have, you know, the natural gas little micro plants all over the different places, those are just going to be vacant. I mean, that, that's oh, incredible. It's, it's like, th think of the shopping malls yeah. times whatever. I mean, this is, this is you're, you're yeah. not only eliminating the jobs, but just the difference of the land use. Have, have you looked into that more? Yeah. Because I found that to be really interesting. Well, just, to, just a little bit enough to know that it's almost overwhelming to even try and picture it. Like, if, if you think of... Um, you're sort of in northern, but I guess everywhere across North America has uh, natural gas infrastructure. Um, and just think of, of of stopping the use of that and then dismantling it even. And just if you're going to reclaim it, like how many streets would you have to rip up to get all these lines ripped up? Or, or what do you do with all the facilities? Or on the oil side, like there's the, like you say, all the terminals, all of the refineries themselves. What do you do with all of this infrastructure? And all of the tankers that move uh, oil on water, there's like thousands and thousands of them. All of the, the shipping terminals, the, the trucks, the distribution truck, just, just the, the web of moving energy around. And it's sort of invisible to people. They don't really notice it. Most of it's underground. There's hundreds of thousands of miles of pipelines in the United States that people don't even know that they're there. And, and to just to stop using all this infrastructure. And then at the same time, if you if people can even start to grasp the magnitude of that infrastructure, which they virtually never do, to think that you can replace it with wind and solar, it's just so laughable that it's there's it's just I don't even know where to start trying to describe that. If if you think of the energy consumption of any city of any size, pick a city of half a million people, and look at how much petroleum goes through there and how much natural gas goes through there, and then think that you're going to replace it. At the same time that it's getting harder and harder to build anything at any time, there's the NIMBY people, not in my backyard. There's the, the people, the regulatory hurdles. Um, everybody's offended by everything now. When you want to build something, there's always a reason why you can't build it because some landmark will get knocked down or some street can't be blocked off or, or you name it. Uh, and, that, and that's happening everywhere. It's, it's just that's um, to build any kind of infrastructure just gets harder and harder and harder. Um, and some of it's for various reasons, but to think that you're going to convert such a massive system into something completely different in any any reasonable time frame, it's, I, I, anybody that says that they can, like I just say, like, can you just show me even the start of a roadmap how you would do that? How how would you replace a highway and rep with a high speed rail line? Like California abandoned that plan to have a, a high speed rail link from San Francisco to Los Angeles when the cost estimate hit $77 billion. So that's one rail line between two cities. So, so how are you going to do that times 50 around the United States? Like it, it's just, it's, it becomes nonsensical when you think about it, but people don't think about it. So, What you working on these days? Oh, well, just uh, fighting a good fight, trying to, uh, I write as much as I can, and then um, I have a day job here. I work for a natural gas company, so we're trying to keep the lights on, so. What's that company? Uh, I don't think we've ever talked about that. What's the name of that company? Go ahead and give your guys a plug. Oh, it's, called, uh, it's called Outlier Resources. It's just a tiny little private company. We're owned by the people in our office here. So 
um, yeah, we're, we're private and don't make news ever. So, um, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, uh, try and, try and do the best job we can of producing a clean fuel for the world. And, uh, yeah, that's what we do. Do you guys, are you just up in Canada or you got, you said Marcellus. So when you said that, I assumed you must be doing business in the Marcellus. Uh, no, no, we're just up in Canada, but because of the, uh, um, the pipeline constraints in Canada. There's very few places that our natural gas can go. I we, see. Uh, Canada p- produces more than, than we use, and so we have to export it. We would love to export it offshore, build a terminal, uh, an LNG export terminal, and we're trying to get one built on the west coast here in British Columbia, but it's it's been years and years and years, and it's one, there was something like 20 of them on, on, um, on the drawing board. We're down to one now. And it might be going within four or five years if we can get a pipeline built to connect it. And, and that, that's part of the frustration up here that we, we can't even get one built. If we look at we, what's happened in the United States, you built like 10 of them down there in the time that we tried to get one advanced. Uh, so, so we're forced to sell our gas on whatever pipelines are existing now. For us, that means selling it into the Chicago market. So, and the prices there have been depressed because of well, the, the strong Marcellus production largely. So. That's one I reason see. we watch that a lot to see what's going to happen there. Yeah. And also some of the Bach and um, associated gas that comes along with the oil that uh, yeah, adds to the glut in the market. This is great for consumers. It's cheap fuel, but yeah. So. And so like these these processing plants or these um, whatever, what, what was that out in uh, distribution facilities? That's probably what you yeah. guys need the most right now? Because I see that headline all the time about that that whatever's going on in British Columbia with the, with these facilities. I see headlines all the time. Oh, yeah. there's a, the, the biggest one, the biggest stumbling block right now is um, an oil pipeline. It's called the Trans Mountain Expansion. There's, there's an existing pipeline that goes from, <clears throat> excuse me, um, northern Alberta to the, to the west coast by Vancouver. It's called Trans Mountain Pipeline. It was owned by Kinder Morgan until they got set up and left the country and <laughs> sold it to the federal government here. And they were trying to expand it, and that's the biggest battle right now. They'd like to double the size of it. But the uh, problem is that it will haul, uh, part of that expansion will include, oil, or the product that would move on it would be oil from the oil sands. And the oil sands have, like, the worst name in the world right now. The environmentalists really threw it in on it because it's such a large resource, I think. And so they've done everything but move heaven and earth to get uh, the oil sands landlocked so that the oil can't get to market. They're trying to strangle it. And they've done a great job of it. They're succeeding. And so this, this poor pipeline, which is being built along an existing right-of-way, uh, it just can't even get twinned. Um, and it has, it's had government approvals of various levels. The federal government's approved it a couple times. And then just when they're ready to put the shovels in the ground, oh, up pops some little special interest group with the lawsuit. And then six months later, we've got to get that resolved. And then there's another one. And um, yeah, it just can't get built, and, and now it's turned into it's turned into a symbolic thing, which is unfortunate because now the the climate movement has taken that as their um, their their hill to die on, and so they won't let it. They just will not let it happen. They'll do anything in their power. They'll resist arrest. They'll hang from bridges. They'll do whatever to stop this pipeline. Uh, it's it's gotten to the point where it's almost comical if it wasn't so sad for the economy. So that's the one that makes the news, and at the same time. They're, we're trying to get a natural gas pipeline built to the coast so that we can export LNG. That has a little bit more support because natural gas is a cleaner fuel, although a lot of people are still trying to stop that dead also. So there's um, yeah, a lot of wars going on there. So the, 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 the groups that are against fossil fuels are, are very advanced and very strong here in Canada. So they're, they're very good at what they do. Are they crazy? There's no price for them, personally. Are, <laughs> they are, are crazy. Are, are they? Are, I will confirm that they are crazy. They're, they're, I was going to say, are they, are they crazy like the ones in the U.S. have gotten? They are. Yes. Yeah. It's it's the, the AOCs and the Warrens and the Sanders. It, it, these people, they they they'll, they say anything they want, and like I said, it's the well, I'll hand them the keys and see how you do it. Listen, any one of those AOC, it, well, AOCs. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, in, anybody who in and listen, I, I'm not sure what your definition of crazy is up in Canada. But when here in America, when I went to school for this and when I covered the media and when did a number of these things, we, we, we were taught about chicken littles. 
Okay, the people that said the world is going to end with Y2K, the people who came out and, and, you know, the purveyors of paranoia, if you will, we were taught not to give these people the time of day because. Is that right? Wow. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because for one, it was you're kind of pandering and making fun of them and encouraging them. And there's no news (laughs) value behind it. There's no value outside of entertainment. And if you're going to do that, well, just have a telenote novella then and just, you know, go have a soap opera and go do a movie, go do whatever it is. But as a media and, and as a news organization and et cetera, there is a certain level of responsibility to the public. You got to be the eyes and the ears for the people out in the busy, busy world out there. You can't allow the chicken littles a bigger platform than they already have. That's what we're always taught. And so when I started, oh, yeah, that's just common sense, man. You can't be telling people that, you know, yelling there's a fire in the in 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 the in the in the 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 movie theater. People run over and kill themselves. War of the Worlds. People jumped out of buildings when they thought um, aliens were coming down. So it's documented the mass hysteria that you can have from a psychological point of view. That, of course, has been brought into the world of media saying, okay, we can't do that. We have a certain responsibility here. And mm-hmm. as intellectual beings, we have a responsibility to not do this chicken little. Well, it's, I mean, b- book of revelations, if you will. <laughs> there we go. We'll go all the way back to that. <laughs> so, what, I mean, do you know what I mean by that? To where there's a certain just level of chicken little to this, isn't there? Oh, there absolutely is. And it's, it's I'm, I'm surprised to hear you say that because the, it, from my perspective, the media has totally abandoned that principle and because they are encouraging it. And they're, like, up here, I don't know if you have it down there yet, but our our federal government, our federal government, the, the group that's running our nation, declared a climate emergency. And they said it's an emergency, and this is an official declaration that we have to um, get off fossil fuels and, and, and limit emissions, even though Canada is responsible for only 1.6% of global emissions. If Canada was wiped out off the map, if someone came in here and herded everyone out and turned off the lights, the, the emissions impact would be zero on the world because we export raw materials to the world and they would get them from somewhere else and probably a place that has worse standards than we do. So, the, But yet we're willing to strangle our industries here for for this purpose. And, and, it's, and you're right, it's, it's a chicken little syndrome going on. And I, it's, I flipped open the news here, and, and what people really worry about here, I just the headline that popped up on Reuters is Chile is rioting. They declared a state of emergency because there's been a, a hike in transit fares, and, and people don't want to pay another nickel. And this is what it's like in the developing world, which is where most of the people live. We're just a bunch of spoiled people here who who, could, who feel the, the uh, ability to demand these things because they're not accountable for anything. This is incredible to me because um, I didn't know that. And I just read this morning that Alaska declared a state of emergency. Some some AFF or something like that um, in Alaska, one of the groups declared the same thing because of climate. Alaska. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a mania. Alaska of all places. So it's you, you can't explain it. It's like mass hypnosis. But well, and and, that, and that's the part that I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to is that let's say we took out the climate change and put in Y2K. Would people... It's, it's very similar, yeah. It totally yeah. is. And, and would people really want to sacrifice $18 trillion and get rid of an industry and a way of life based on the fear of Y2K? Would people have done that? Because they're doing that right now. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're willing to... But you, you don't need like we can't, you can't even make sense of the uh, extent they're willing to go to do these things. Like the the New York situation, where they're the governor is ordering the utility to hook up um, customers, and the utility is saying we can't do it. It's not safe to do it. There's not enough natural gas. We need a new pipeline, and they're saying no. You're not getting a pipeline, and you're hooking up the customers, and you better make it work because you're just a greedy corporation. <laughs> so, like, how do you make sense of that? So. I think it's all of these people that are pushing these things have ne- are not responsible for anything. They don't run businesses. I don't even think they run their own households from the looks of most of them. They they just say what they want and demand what they want. So it, it's, a, it's a tough battle 
when you're the adult in the room and you're telling it, you're trying to shut down the party, it's pretty hard to do. When the police are on the side of the partiers, that's what's happening in Canada here. So, yeah, it's it's very bizarre to me. A lot of this behavior and a lot of this this um, decision making and just some of the mass hysteria. I've, I've, yeah. I mean, well, it's, you guys are going to get it right between the eyes. Well, it, it's it's unusual to have made it to that level of leadership. I mean, these are these are supposed to be some very good leaders and, and people in charge of our futures and this and that. I I, I I'm starting to wonder if maybe people aren't better off deciding their own <laughs> instead of having to rely on. Yeah. Well, that's that's amazing. Like just the the fact that you said Canada declared, you know, state of emergency the way they did. Your, your story there. I mean, how many people made that choice? Less than 100, probably. Maybe 200? I don't know. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's a, it's a handful. And it's, um, but when you're, when you, you think that you have the, you're fighting the good fight against an enemy, and that, that's what the, that's what it's come down to. It's, it's like a good versus evil thing for people. And, and they're, it's easy to paint eggs on mobile as the, the, the enemy, right? Because they're, I mean, just like a big fat target right on them. And it's oh. just been it's a stereotypical thing that big oil is responsible for all the evil and the so which side are they on? And and it, it's easy to it, it's a bit like you're talking politics earlier. That that's easy route for people of the left, especially when they're arguing that they're fighting to help people, and then they paint themselves. If they're fighting to help people, then the enemy must be fighting to hurt people by definition. That's how they try and frame it. So. And and they've just they've had a cakewalk in this arena on the energy side. That's for sure. No, nobody's really stood up to them before. Oh, isn't it crazy how they just they, they turn it into a spiritual warfare to where all the way down to uh, man and the fossil fuel industry has spoiled Mother Earth, the Garden of Eden has ruined it, pristineness created a emotional feel so that science has nothing to do with it but you make a very connective, a very emotional f- feel to it. And now they're preaching the days of res- revelations that if you don't do exactly, oh, it's it, you can't make it up. Oh, wait, it, it's already been no, written. You can't make it up. But it's already been written. I mean, it's, it's, it's unusual how they've basically used, you know, ba- the Bible as, as a playbook for, for what they're trying to do. I, that's how I've honestly. I never thought of that. Oh well, I was a Sunday school teacher for eight years, and I went. I was an altar boy and went oh, to a private school. So yeah, I was. I was. Hey man, I was a Catholic. I was spoon fed fear and guilt my whole life, and so <laughs> that's my Catholic. But you're okay joke. though, right? Sorry, I just lost half my audience because I, I made my first uh, <laughs> religious. But no, I mean, uh, when you teach the Bible like I did for eight years to children. You, you start to see like, wow, this is basically what they're doing, except they, they've taken out, you know, the, the elements of Christianity and just put in environmentalism. That's how I've honestly looked yeah, at that's this. that's what it seems like. It's, it's like religion, for sure. Yeah, and like I tell people, you can go back on my, my interviews for the last five to seven years, and I started doing interviews on this five to seven years ago because I recognized it. And, and that's mm-hmm. what they've done. They've turned it into where it's become almost like a spiritual warfare for them. Yeah, I, I agree. That's it's, well, they're willing to be arrested for it, and it's uh, yeah, it's like a social justice cause. So, well, you know, yeah. and, and the reason I went off on that little tangent was because you know the way that you mentioned um, the 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 handful of people making the major decisions for the entire country of Canada, and they basically do it for the greater good, type of a thing, you know, for for the that's their yeah. argument. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Their- Okay, all right, there I, I went off the rails today. Gee, sorry, man, I'm, I, I, I didn't expect to do that. So uh, let's talk a little bit no about, uh, kind of summary a little bit, back to where uh, public energy number one, where uh, you were talking about some of the entrepreneurship and just government roles, and talk to just summarize how that ties in with the oil and gas industry and the entrepreneurship and, and the government roles and who pays whose salary and all that other stuff. Yeah, it, yeah, and it's kind of a multi-level thing too. The example I use in there in the neighboring province, but it's happening everywhere. Uh, and so in Saskatchewan, the um, the because of the climate movement and the extremism of it, they they put in a policy where they said, okay, we want a bunch of solar power. So they, it's a provincial utility that owns the uh, electrical grid, and um, they said, okay, let's 
we're going to welcome electric power. We're, I mean, uh, solar power. We're going to go green. We're going to everybody to put solar panels on the roof. We're going to give you incentives to do so. We're going to let you finance the cost of the equipment, and um, and we'll give you preferential power rates. And whenever the sun's shining, you sell your power back to the grid, and it's all going to be wonderful. So a bunch of people jumped on this, of course. And, well, people want to be green fundamentally. I think a lot of people do want to do the right thing. And so the, a whole industry developed uh, around this policy and um, a bunch of, and these were sort of entrepreneurs too, but they created it based on, just based on this uh, kind of a, a framework that the government, it's a government run utility. So they created this incentive for more solar power. And then all of a sudden they got, it was too popular because the terms were too good. And so they realized, whoa, we got too much solar power now. Like we're, this is starting to cost us a fortune and, we're at, and we have too much power at the wrong time of day when we don't need it. So then they, they said, okay, well, we can't carry on like this because it's going to bankrupt the comp- the utility. So they, they, they enforced the cap that they had said. They said, we hit, we hit the cap we had envisioned way too early. And now this whole uh, business has been um, nullified almost. All these people have been put out to work because they're, they were, um, there, there weren't, it wasn't like a true entrepreneurial market-driven demand for these things. It was created by a, a government dictate, which, which distorted the economics. And that's sort of different than the angle that we're talking about, uh, just the pure economics of, of an entrepreneur going out and starting a business. The true entrepreneur is one that like, starts a business and understands business and builds it, and they live on their own. They live and die by their own efforts, not by an artificial um, structure created by a government or an unfair subsidy or something like that. It's the, the, the true entrepreneurs, they get up and they, 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 they do it themselves. They're self-creating machines and they do it again and again and again. Governments, and if you just, if your job is created by a government, you, you better be careful because it's not real in a sense. Um, the, the, the hope is that it'll take root enough that it'll become real, but it, it's, it just doesn't work that way more often than not. How can people find your websites and books and all the good stuff? Give yourself a, a, a little bit of a literary plug here. Oh, sure. Thanks. Well, it's uh, the, the, the world is in desperate need of a new energy conversation, I would think. That's what I, I try and provide. I just try and um, uh, if, if people don't know a lot about energy in general, and they, they, because we take everything for granted that shows up automatically, and energy is the most um, critical of those we we fill up with fuel whenever we want to our houses are heated we go to the supermarket and everything we want is there and it's all brought to us by fossil fuels and so there's people out there there's a huge movement that's trying to say we don't need fossil fuels anymore and the public tends to believe them because the uh, the media narrative is so strong so i try and write all i'm trying to do in my writing is just to point out wait a minute it's not as simple as you're being told I'm trying I'm try to skirt the controversies. I don't want to get into Greta Thunberg, to any of those the weeds about the hockey stick shape of global warming. I don't care about that. All I'm saying is you, you need to understand the realities of the energy world, and that's what I try and write about, because what they're getting fed in the media just isn't correct. So 